You're listening to the Running in Production podcast, where developers and engineers talk about their tech stacks, lessons learned, and general tips from running web apps in production. Here's Nick and today's guest. Welcome to Running in Production. Today I'm with Andrew Brown, who is running Ruby on Rails in production, and Rails is a web framework written in Ruby, in case you couldn't guess from its name. Andrew, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me here. Uh, do you want to start off by introducing yourself and letting people know a little bit about the app that we're going to be talking about today? Yeah, sure. So uh, uh, as you just heard, my name is Andrew Brown. Uh, I'm based in uh, Toronto, Canada. So uh, it's uh, we are getting snow here, if you're wondering. Uh, and my platform is Exam Pro. And what it is, it's a learning management system which serves up uh, AWS certification content. So I created the content myself, um, and I've also created the LMS uh, with my co-founder, who's also named Andrew. Uh, and so, you know, that's what we do. Nice. That must be confusing with both of you named Andrew. Uh, yeah, so we call, uh, uh, and the other Andrew's last name is Baco, so we just refer to him as Baco. But we assume that if we had a third co-founder, they, uh, we, they'd have to be named Andrew. Yeah, there's no, there's no other way. <laughs> there's no other way, but uh, that probably wouldn't be very uh, fair hiring practices, so we'd have to think about that. So is it just you two that work on the project, or is there anyone else? Oh, no, we have, we have juniors. So uh, I do mentorship with um, a lot of uh, bootcamp grads and stuff like that. And so I give them the opportunity to work on our production code base. Uh, so we have people uh, coming and going all the time, working on different components. Uh, so I can't say it's just us. Um, generally, it's us two. And at any given time, we might have two to five other uh, graduates or juniors working with us. Oh, wow. So yeah, quite a number of people there. So how, so how long has your platform now been running in production? Um, so the way I define production is people can pay for it and it doesn't go down uh, and we don't plan on wiping the database. So I would say that was since October 2018. So last, so almost just over a year ago, uh, the platform was uh, built uh, prior to that. I think I'd built a rough version out in uh, April of 2018. And at that time, it wasn't actually uh, uh, fully realized what we want to do with the platform. I was just, st I was just trying to pass into certifications and I wanted a way to have practice exam or not practice exam, um, flashcards, uh, that was space repetition, but yet I didn't like some of the open source solutions. So I had written my own and some other people asked me if they could use it. And then I ended up with a startup somehow. <laughs> nice. So speaking of startups and running in production, so what, what motivated, motivated you to use Ruby on Rails? Well, I've been using Ruby on Rails since version 0.8.6. Uh, that's like 2005 or 2006. In fact, if you go to the Wikipedia page and uh, see what was the first version of Rails, it doesn't list prior to one. Um, and so, you know, because I have a lot of traction there, it just was an, an easy fit for me. But it actually wasn't my first choice. So um, uh, I actually wanted to build out the platform serverless. Uh, and, but at the time I just felt, uh, I would, I probably do it now, but at the time it wasn't very productive. I, I put two weeks in and I just said, okay, do, do I really care about building something serverless? Do I care about getting a platform out that, uh, that can be utilized? And so I just switched over to rails, uh, and it's been running Rails since. Um, but I can't say that it's your typical rails app. I mean, it is very simple in terms of rails, but I've definitely bolted on a lot of modern functionality. So. Right. So you've been using Rails basically since the beginning of time. Uh, were there certain aspects of Rails that just made it a good fit for your application or were you kind of just leaning on prior experience? Uh, prior experience, but also simplicity. So, you know, I evaluated other frameworks uh, besides just going serverless. I was thinking about Golang or even uh, Elixir with Phoenix, just because, uh, you know, Rails has some uh, specific pain points I'd like to avoid. Uh, and I just, I, I, I'm always looking for that perfect solution. It probably doesn't exist. You just have to accept one thing and work with it. Um, but uh, you know, uh, one thing I really don't like about uh, Rails is the amount of memory it consumes. I don't say Ruby because Ruby uh, isn't that bad at consuming uh, memory, but Rails is uh, definitely a beast when it comes to it. And also just uh, there is some uh, fin finickiness uh, where when you're provisioning your servers, uh, you know, I could, I could have a build working uh, uh, great for six months and then it breaks and now I'm spending like two days trying to fiddle with like uh, a system D uh, system D startup commands or something like trying to get Puma to work and there's no documentation you're just goofing around so uh, definitely not my first choice but definitely what I'm using uh, today nice and uh, you kind of hinted at this before but just for clarity so if you were to actually start this project over today would you still reach for rails 
Um, if I had uh, in my back pocket uh, a serverless framework uh, that I invested in uh, that solved all my issues, then I would probably start from there. Um, if I didn't, I would still start with Rails because it definitely is the fastest track to getting an application started. I personally don't think it's bad to start with a monolith as long as you have a plan uh, wait, a plan out. I always think of monoliths as being optimized for uh, developer happiness and definitely not optimized for DevOps happiness. Uh, so, you know, you'd like think of SimCity, right? If you start with a budget of 20K, uh, uh, you don't want to spend that entire budget laying down uh, a single double wide highway. You need to do your dirt roads and then plan for the future. And so I see monolith as a fit for that. So I definitely don't think that's it's a bad anyway. Right. And for uh, people listening, SimCity... I mean, it's been a long time since I've played that game, but I, I guess you're just trying to say that, uh, you know, you, you don't really want to start with the end result before you build up like a good foundation. Like I kind of see microservices maybe as just being something you maybe progress into, not so much something you start with. Is that how you feel or is it different? I think it's just, it's dependent. So like, again, we come back to SimCity, but if you, if you already played the game 50 times over and you have a, a, a good budget, you can, you can sit up on day one uh, a more scalable solution. Uh, if you don't, then you still have to go through uh, the process of working within the means of your budget. Budget being your productivity, uh, uh, you know, your security, whatever, whatever that stuff is, right? Um, so, you know, like when I built out this application, I didn't start day one as an isomorphic JavaScript uh, uh, application. I, do- I totally could have, but I decided that, you know, I'm going to make it static pages. And then when I need JavaScript, I'm going to put in JavaScript. And then when uh, plain JavaScript doesn't work, I'll, I'll evaluate a JavaScript framework, and then I will move it to isomorphic. But because I've done this so many times over, I you know I didn't have to do heavy lifting to move to the next stage. Whereas if you if you don't have that future visibility, you're going to be feeling that pain, right? Um, right. So. Mm-hmm. So then rewinding a bit, you talked a little bit about like your app is a little bit customized. Uh, is it is it a monolithic Rails app, or do you have other services as well? So Rails by nature, uh, I mean, it is a monolith, but uh, the, it's also modular, right? So if you understand that nature of Rails and you work within those confines, then you can uh, uh, detach that. Think of like a space station, right, where it has mod- modular parts. So uh, one part where we're doing something different is like at, with Active Record, we don't try to lean on it too heavy. So like we don't use scopes or any kind of advanced stuff because the day tomorrow we want to move off of Active Record. Uh, it's it's those more uh, abstractions or DSLs that are going to make that friction harder for us. All of our um, reads, so anytime we're reading, we're never ever using Active Record objects. We're always using raw SQL uh, with Postgres, so we return back uh, the JSON directly. So it returns a JSON string. It just passes along, and it's super super fast. And the added benefit is that all of our uh, queries are uh, live actually in a directory. So all we have to do tomorrow, if we want to move it serverless, we just pick up our queries and and move with it, right? And we can leave uh, a portion of active record behind, at least the reads. Um, so there's a lot of things like that. Or, uh, you know, we have an admin namespace and then you have your the application namespace. And uh, what we decided, uh, and this is just because I know from uh, scaling up uh, Rails applications is that we broke it up into Rails engines, which are smaller Rails applications, right? So tomorrow if I say, okay, I want to not have the admin panel in the repo anymore, I just put it in its own repo, now it can be on its own instance, and uh, that's not gonna tie us up. So there's definitely ways to uh, be kind of like a, a, uh, a microservices inside of a monolith with Rails, but we also leverage a lot of things around it, but yeah. Talking about Rails engine, so do you actually have that admin engine, is that in a different repo then, or is it the same one? No, for the time being, it's in a it's it's still part of the, the core th- uh, application. I would just say that you have to reach a point where you have to justify putting it in its own repo, uh, we definitely actually have way more than 10 repos, um, but that's not part of the Rails app, right? So, but yeah, the the admin right now is still sitting with the uh, the the core of the app, yeah. Yeah, that for sure makes sense. So things get really unwieldy when you start talking about multiple Git repos and yeah, many different services, like deployment actually becomes very hard. Mm-hmm. Or just even getting developers up to speed. It's like, well, how do you manage that when, you know, you have to clone like 17 Git repos just to start the app up? Yeah, so you have to decide, you know, when is it, you know, when is this worth over that, right? Uh, But we are pretty heavy duty on documentation. I think you had a a bit of taste of how fast I produce content. So you can only imagine like how vast our knowledge base is. And especially since we have 
uh, graduates coming, uh, graduates or juniors coming uh, through. It's so important to us that we don't have to sit with you to figure stuff out, that you can rely on that knowledge base. We've actually also uh, put our knowledge base within our LMS. So if, like tomorrow, if I want a, uh, a graduate to like work on a production app, they just have to pass our micro course on how to use our platform. <laughs> so I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, that is very cool. I guess jumping subjects a little bit here. So is your application uh, server-side rendered with like sprinkles of JavaScript or is it like API-based with uh, some really JavaScript-heavy front end? It's going to, uh, it's, it's becoming a micro, uh, sorry, uh, isomorphic. So originally it was static pages, then it was onto JavaScript. Uh, and now we've adopted a JavaScript framework. Um, I actually wrote my own uh, prior that I used for years, uh, but it wasn't using... It wasn't using a modern, um, uh, I can't remember what you call web pa uh, Webpack, but it wasn't using Webpack to uh, bundle and assemble the content. It was using like a Ruby gem. And so I was deciding saying, okay, should I use Angular or, or, or um, React or Vue? And I just, I actually evaluated every single one again. And I just said, no way, because it's so unproductive. I could, I, we could do a whole podcast on how I feel that modern JavaScript frameworks are so unproductive. So I just took my old code and I modernized it. And uh, I now have a new JavaScript framework called Dilithium JS, which uh, if I could solve one piece of JavaScript uh, for like, uh, uh, you'd, you'd probably see a lot more code on GitHub on it. But uh, anyway, it is right now uh, isomorphic, uh, partially. Uh, and we're, we're working to completely separate the front end. So soon enough, there will be no stack pages and the entire front end will be served up from uh, static or from S3A. The static website hosting. Interesting. Yeah. So that that is quite a bit different than um, like what you get out of the box with Rails, right? Well, I mean, if you run Rails in Rails API mode, right, then you would be forced to uh, build out your um, your your JavaScript uh, in isolate, right? Mm -hmm. um, one thing that you have in Rails is Webpacker, which is supposed to be a convenient way to use Webpack, and I don't do that. I find I, I just know from uh, from experience that. Sometimes you have tools where they they are a convenience, but they they become a maintenance pain later down the road, uh, and they also create another layer of abstraction of confusion. So like I don't use Webpacker even though it's convenient. I just use Webpack directly. And also like let's say tomorrow I want to lift that out of the application. You can't exactly lift Webpacker out with uh, with it with services like it, like cloud computing services. So that's why you always have to think, okay, can I lift this? Is it isolate stuff like that? Or you know like if you're using um, uh, it's old, but like Solar or Elasticsearch, there are um, abstractions or DSLs that make it easier to work with it. But again, what happens when you need to lift that out as its own microservice? So that's why I always try to avoid these conveniences. Uh, and uh, when you accept these uh, simpler things, then you're going to have a lot less pain down the road. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. So I started with Rails uh, pretty, well, very late compared to you back when like Rails 4.0 came out. So oh. I grew up with Rails using, um, you know, its own asset pipeline. and But moving to Webpacker was, yeah, a very, very big time investment, even if you knew like Webpack beforehand. So I, I like the idea of just using Webpack straight up because like you say, it's very easy just to move that, you know, to something else if you have to. Well, and I have, I have applications that have been in production for eight, nine years that are still Rails and they still use sprockets. Yeah. Uh, so it's fun to scale that stuff out because... The issue is the more files you add, the slower it gets. Uh, and it still does with Webpack as well. So then you, you start to think about your strategy where you, you less care about how many little files you have and you start like grouping them uh, en masse and uh, having that division of files is less important. Hmm. But uh, yeah, um, Sprockets is painful. So one, one last thing about like your back end and front end. So are you actually using uh, Rails as action cable or WebSockets or anything like that? I'm just trying to think here. No, we don't. Because if we need to do anything, we just push it to SQS or Kinesis. So there's no need to store that stuff uh, in Rails. I think at the start, I had some things running um, uh, running with, uh, I'm trying to remember. I think Action Cable is for is just for WebSockets, right? Yeah. Sorry, you know, I was thinking of um, uh, Action Job or whatever it's called. They keep on renaming everything in Rails. Active job, active yeah, job. That's active what it job. Is. Yep. So, active job, we're not really using too much of. Uh, again, we just leverage AWS services to push that uh, stuff on there. Uh, just because, again, if we have to move that stuff out, action cable, we actually are using. Uh, I'm trying to remember what I'm using it for. I can't remember, but we definitely use action cable for something. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so that was quite the flip, eh? <laughs> yeah. 
I guess I was going to say, like, what's the rest of your tech stack looking like? But I mean, are you even using something like Sidekick or no? I have Sidekick in production for uh, some of my other applications, but no, not anymore. Because if you use Sidekick, then you're reliant on Redis. Um, and then that means I have to sit up a Elastic Cache server, and that's a big pain in the butt. And also, you know, just using Sidekick for so many years, it's just like there's certain pains with it I don't enjoy. Um, and the other issue is like, let's say tomorrow you have to take those um, those active jobs and you need to uh, move them into microservices such on such as Fargate or stuff like that. I've definitely had that pain where uh, I'm running out of memory and I'm doing like really heavy duty stuff. Uh, and so to me, it's just it's not worth doing it anymore that way, like for for like scaling. So. I would just avoid it. I would just use Fargate uh, and Ibis Lambdas, um, or I would use um, what's really, really cool is Step Functions in AWS. Mm. It's so, so good for stitching um, um, like microservices and serverless workflows together. So I just avoid those things. Anything to, you know, anything like that, yeah. So are, are there any specific Ruby gems that you have to interface with SQS or take the role of putting things out there to do something in the background? Yeah, I use Ruby, I use Abus SDK uh, SQS. So I use the plainest one possible. Uh, there is one called, uh, um, it's like based off of Street Fighter, Shuriken. Shuriken. Mm -hmm. Do you know the word I'm talking about? Vaguely. I think it's a Shuriken, but I actually haven't looked up on that in quite a while. Okay. So uh, anyway, that's the name of the gem. And what it does is it allows you to work directly with um, Active Job. And so that's what you could use. But again, you know, it's just avoiding those DSLs, avoiding those those things that keep you tied to the framework, right? Because eventually you're going to have to Frankenstein your application, cut it up. Right. So those are the things that are going to cause you pain down the road. Definitely. So as for the rest of um, your stack, is everything Dockerized or no? No. So we thought about Dockerizing uh, our Rails application, uh, but there's just a lot of pain. Uh, so actually... We have a Dockerized version to run our test code on code build, but our main application, uh, yeah, we're not, we don't have it Dockerized. Um, there's no good reason not to do it. It was just the fact that when we first set it up, I was just, I provisioned an Amazon Linux 2, and I invested all that effort in Amazon Linux 2 that I didn't want to uh, rewrite it again into a, a Docker container. There's also just issues with synergies with um, different AWS services. Um, so if I can remember it correctly, it was just the fact that if you want to, this is where, this is where you start thinking less like a developer and more like a solution architect. And you have to think about all the, um, the call, what is it called? Cloud pathways, but it's all the stuff that you have to deal with, with your data, right? So let's say I need to harden my instance, like my server, what compliancy am I going to use for that? Right? So, uh, if you know the uh, CIS, uh, the center of internet security, uh, they have um, hardened instances that you can get from the AWS marketplace, but they only have it for very specific OSs, right? So now that's going to limit your OS choice. Or if you want to use Amazon Inspector, which is going to do compliance checks on your, uh, like a security benchmark against your instance to make sure that it's secure, uh, it only supports specific OSs. Or if you want to use um, code build, it's only going to support very specific OSs. Or if you want to have a developer environment that's like an IDE, think of like, um, uh, which is like Cloud9, that only supports um, very specific OSs. So with, if you keep, keep all those things in mind, that's going to limit your choice, right? And that was something we had to have really fight about what to use. And what we ended up doing was we actually have um, our instance provisioned in three different ways on three different things. Uh, and eventually, as the technology catches up, we'll have that one across everything. So that's something that developers don't think about because they're not thinking of like, okay, how do I solve all these things which are going to come down the road later on? Wait, so let me just make sure I understand that. You said you set up instances in different ways. Are, are developers then developing on EC2 instances or no? So we run all of our developer environments on Cloud9. Ah, Cloud9, okay. Yeah, and so that uses, it can use Amazon Linux 1 or uh, a very specific version of Ubuntu. We want to use Amazon, Amazon Linux 1 uh, instead of Ubuntu, but the problem there is is that uh, Amazon Linux 1 uses a different uh, upstart job. So it uses init-d, whereas if you want to use Postgres 11 or 10, you have to use system-d. And so now you can't use Amazon Linux 1, and so we want to use Amazon Linux 2, but you can't use that with CloudFormation templates to then automate uh, or like provision new developer environments when you're adding developers. So then we have to use Ubuntu, right? Yeah. So it's just like you're going down the rabbit hole on all these different things. And then you kind of go, man, I wish I was using serverless <laughs> because <laughs> that you're not doing, doing any of that kind of stuff. 
So, and that's why I keep on coming back to serverless. There are some pains with serverless that I don't like, but if I can not have those DevOps pains, I would love it. Right. Wow. There's a lot to unwind in what you just said. You mentioned Postgres. So are you using RDS then, or do you actually roll your own EC2 instance? It almost sounds like you're rolling your own, right? No. 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 Uh, Aurora. Ah. We're using Aurora. So the thing is like RDS is great and we used RDS to start with. But there's a price point that you hit where it's like the same cost use RDS versus Aurora. Uh, and it's probably intentional by AWS because they want you to use it. But um, for those who don't know Aurora, Aurora is AWS's um, fully managed uh, relational database for either Postgres or MySQL. And what it will do is it will actually set up like six copies of your database across three availability zones. Um, so it's going to be already like highly available. Like it's just going to be like, uh, like bomb proof. So it just doesn't make sense to use RDS at that point. I would never, ever, 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 ever run a database that is not managed because it's not worth it. Yeah, there's about 85 million things that can go wrong. It, your data is your most important thing. I do not leave that to chance. When people say they use MongoDB as their primary database, I cry because <laughs> it is so susceptible for losing data, so susceptible. Now, Google's made it a lot easier with Firebase, right? They've made it very uh, highly available, uh, available and durable. Uh, Document DB, which is AWS's Mongo-like uh, database or Mongo-compatible database, but uh, you know, I, I just don't find MongoDB as a good fit as a primary database. You can definitely do it, just as you can use DynamoDB as your primary database. Um, but you know, I just, I still think there's a lot of tutorials out there, and people just jump on it. But you know, no judgment. Use whatever you need to do to get the job done, right? Yeah. So it sounds like you're very pretty heavily invested into the AWS stack, which makes sense considering, you know, that's what your training programs are on. Um, do you want to go over a couple other AWS resources that you're using? Uh, well, I would say that we use AWS to a point where it doesn't make sense. For us, it's just practical experience, right? When there's a better tool, we'll still use the AWS version because we just want to know how to use it, right? Yeah. So for, for AWS, yeah, again, so we're using SQS. Uh, we don't touch our servers. Hold on, so sorry you, to interrupt. Do you just yes. want to give the TLDR and what SQS is for listeners? Yeah, sure. So SQS is Simple Queue Service, uh, and it is a queuing uh, a queuing service on AWS. So um, when you, it's for application integration. So let's say you have background jobs you want to run. A very common one is emails, right? Because uh, you don't want that, that to hang up your application. So what you can do is you can uh, queue up uh, messages, um, or maybe they're called events. I always forget the terminology. Messages, I think, onto SQS, and then you'd have another application that pulls those messages, and then uh, if it, um, it will then perform the job that you want to do, send emails or crunch numbers, and then it'll go back to the queue and say, "Hey, I'm done this job. Remove it from the queue." Right. So mm -hmm. if you're in the Rails world, you normally use Sidekick, or you'd use Rescue, or you use Delayed Job. Uh, and I, I, Psychic's actually really good. It's super, super, super fast because it's Redis based, but the, again, maintaining is a pain in the butt. So I just, we made that trade saying, ah, we don't need that neck break speed. And if we did, we'd use Kinesis, uh, right. which is real time, right? Yeah, that totally makes sense. Because in, in a lot of cases, it's like, well, you know, if it responds back in 60 milliseconds instead of five, like you're still in pretty good shape, especially if it's a background job. Yeah, uh, actually, in our application, all of our responses are like 60, 50 milliseconds at least. Uh, or sorry, like, um, yeah, like that's where they usually sit around with no caching because we skipped the um, active record layer. So th I, that's what I found out. So like back in 2011 or 12, I had like a crisis because everyone was mass exiting Rails because they're saying Rails can't scale, Rails is too slow. And then Node.js was on the scene. They're like, it's non-blocking and et cetera, et cetera. And I was feeling some pains because I was building out some B2C applications, business to consumer applications, where you get a lot of traffic. And uh, I was like, okay, should I move to Go? Should I move to uh, Elixir? And then I just looked at what the problem was and, and where the bottlenecks was. And it wasn't really Rails. It was just one part. It was just fetching the data from the database and the fact that it would translate that into uh, uh, Ruby objects. And then it would have to then translate that into JSON uh, and that cost was the most expensive cost, right? And then you'd have to add a caching layer and it's just still slow. It was just still slow and, and cumbersome and a pain to maintain. And everyone's saying there's this better stuff. And so Postgres at the time had just come out with JSON functions. And I thought, well, what if you could just return JSON directly from the database? And that proved to be insanely fast. So like when I write my uh, uh, SQL, raw SQL, it basically looks like the shape of the data that I want it to be returned in. 
Uh, so I don't need to use GraphQL and I don't need to do any kind of layer. Uh, ca- there is caching, but I don't have to like manually do any kind of caching of any sorts. Uh, and it's unbelievable that it's like 50, 60 milliseconds. Yeah. That's like very, very fast considering what it's doing. But a lot of people just throw, throw everything out and they go, Oh, we need a faster language. We need a faster, you know what I mean? R- r- instead of really looking at the problem, not to say that it like Elixir isn't amazing because it, it's absolutely amazing, but you have to ask yourself like, what kind of speed do you actually need for this? What is your use case? Right. right. So, and also, like, but, what's the bottleneck? Is it I/O or CPU bound? Is all sorts of stuff. Hmm. But um, yeah, we're using we're using tons of AWS services. But I, you know, I was saying earlier there that we don't ever touch our servers, and by that I mean you cannot SSH in. There's no way to get into that server to touch anything. That uh, for us, like, security is a huge. I love security. I do like so many security talks, and uh, our our application is like overboard in terms of security. And you cannot, you cannot touch the application. You have to do everything through run commands. Uh, if we have a user that comes in our system and they need like escalated privileges, uh, we don't give them uh, roles. We don't assign them more privileges. We actually just make uh, through systems manager, we create an automation task that will execute the thing that they want to do. So if they need to restart the server, we'll go create that task for them. Um, so it depends on what it is. Yeah, I think that's like number one thing people need to learn is stop touching your code. Don't fill with things. If you have a problem, go back to your... Uh, your provi- your configuration scripts like Ansible or whatever, fix those things, or your infrastructure, right? Yeah. Uh, and get into get out of being uh, reactive and being more proactive. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So yeah, I was gonna get to that too. Like, what's your deploy process look like? But I feel like there's a couple more AWS questions. Maybe we can go over first. Sure. You know, heavily invested with AWS services. Do you are you, do you have the Rails app like in front of? An elastic load balancer, or are you using Nginx and then the an ELB or ALB? One hundred percent, you have to put something in front of it. So whether it's uh, uh, CloudFront or ELB, which it's actually in front of both. Okay. So it goes to CloudFront. So it's Rev 3 to CloudFront. Uh, WAF is sitting in front of Cloud uh, is attached to CloudFront, which goes to our ELB and our uh, in, at the um, at, or the instance uh, level. We're not using Nginx because we don't need to. Uh, there's some things like Nginx will do for you, um, which I thought that we would miss, uh, and I can't remember what they are anymore. Something like, like if you need, if well, it depends if you need to terminate SSL. So we don't terminate SSL. You know, I was obsessed with security. We don't terminate SSL at the instance level. We terminate at the ELB level, uh, and we're using uh, Amazon Certification Manager. We don't use Let's Encrypt because that's so painful to use. Um, but I know like if you have it automated, but if, if you have a lot of servers and you're running and we are running multiple servers of our, of our stuff, it's way easier when your, your, your certificate's not part of the instance. Right. So, uh, but anyway, um, we can get away without using Nginx. And since Puma does, uh, the distribution and does the load balancing to all the running, um, processes, we, we don't have to use it, which is really nice. That totally makes sense. Yeah. I, I don't really keep up that much with AWS services, but the last time I checked... Um, you can't keep up. I know. Do you know, <laughs> like a couple, well, it was like a year or two ago, like they introduced ALB, right? Like the application load balancer. Yes. But it, it took them a, a really, really long time just to be able to automatically redirect HTTP to HTTPS. Is that I true? I, I vaguely remember it, that. That's like a year and a half ago you, you were able to do it. So... Um, so yeah, there used to be Elastic Load Balancer, and then they introduced Application Load Balancer, Network Load Balancer. If you're making video games, you want to use NLB. If you're making applications, you want to use ALB. Uh, and ALB, like the huge, the huge sell there was that before, um, if you had an application, you had to make a load balancer for every application because you couldn't do too much uh, routing logic. So a- ALB lets you put like so many things behind one ALB. So if you want to put all your subdomains on one ALB. You could make a routing rule so that you can have like five servers and each of them route to a very specific subdomain. Uh, but yeah, they just didn't have those routing rules. And But now they have lots and it's amazing. You can even route lambdas. So you can have like an ELB, you make a routing rule and then route it to a lambda function, which is really cool, which allows you to like mix and match uh, your you know your traditional with your with uh, serverless. Eh? So is that something you're doing for some some components of the app or no? Yeah, well, that's how you migrate out of a monolith, right? So there's a few strategies, right? You can Dockerize, uh, and again, we could do that. We could run, we could put it on Docker and then put it on ECS, or use Fargate, which uh, you have to decide because it's kind of expensive. Um, but uh, our, you know, our approach is that we don't really like. There's no advantage for us to Dockerize, so that's the reason why we don't do it. Um, we could debate that, 
But uh, yeah, I would just say you break it off, you break off things into Lambda functions, and then you could uh, change the routes. So like the normal route, if it went to a very specific page before, it would just now go to that Lambda function. I'm guessing you're using Route 53. So, but uh, yeah, we do we do fun stuff with Route 53 as well. So uh, last month, I think it was last month, there was actually an issue with AWS uh, and it didn't even show up in the personal health dashboard. That's just like their way of saying like, we're going to tell you when there's something wrong with uh, AWS services. They have like a little dashboard. And uh, there, was in, there was connectivity issues with S3 where you couldn't access stuff from S3 and we had deploys failing, okay? And so I was deploying and I had a, a deploy fail. I said, oh, is it my code? So I went in and I looked and, and every time you deploy with blue-green deployment, it, it gives you another auto-scaling group. And so then you have a big mess of all these extra instances because they keep it around so you can investigate. And I was thinking, well, I don't know what's wrong, but I'm just gonna tear. I'm just gonna terminate everything, even though that's a really bad idea, um, because it'll just all spin up anyway, right? And so I just, I just, because I, I, I just uh, killed everything, and I was expecting the server to start up, and it didn't. And I was like, oh no, what's <laughs> going on? And so the reason why was that the builds were failing. It wasn't obvious, but it's because it couldn't pull the code from S3 because when you use code pipeline. Uh, uh, it, it has a source and it pulls the source from GitHub, puts an S3 bucket, and then it makes it an artifact, which puts it into code build or code deploy. And it couldn't do that part. Uh, and so I was like spinning my wheels and I had Baco here and we spent like 18 hours trying to figure out we're losing it. And, uh, we had to like go in deep and I had to like step through every single deployment step. And then I found out, I was like, oh, S3 is not working. And it wasn't obvious at all. And so then we went to like to open up a ticket and they had like this big bar that said, oh, we already know this problem with s 3 don't tell us. I went to the Reddit and everyone's like, we're all down, we're losing it. And so from that day on, and this is why we're talking about Route 53, from that day on, that's why we always run a second version of our application in another region. And we have, we have a failover. So if uh, something's not working in that one region, it'll fail over with a Route 53 health check, US East uh, 2 or whatever it is. Yeah, that's a really robust situation now when you're dealing with multi-region uh, DNS like that. Yeah, well, I mean, you you get used to it, um, but I think like the sooner you, you get used to it, the easier it is. But again, we only did it when it was a problem, right? So mm -hmm. um, it wasn't a big deal that we're down, it was just embarrassing. So Yeah, plus, I don't know, like I guess your business is a little different because it's so specific to AWS, but for most people, it's like, your average customer isn't going to know which provider you're using. So you never want to be like, oh, well, it's, you know, we're down, but it's not our fault. It's due to AWS. Like they're just not going to know what that means. Well, they don't care. Yeah, exactly. They just, they just want their bath bombs for moms.com. That's my, <laughs> yeah. uh, that's my fake domain. Um, it's bath bombs for moms.com. You know, you mentioned doing DNS failover and stuff like that. I mean, do you have also lots of error reporting and logging and metrics and all that stuff defined in your AWS setup? Yes. So um, we use Datadog, um, but we also just use AWS directly. I just really like Datadog. Um, I'm not always peeking into it very often. People who don't know what that is, uh, it does a bunch of things. So it does um, APM, application process monitoring, that's what it's called. But that gives you like details into your application, like what actions were ran. And uh, it, can, it can do like uh, trends. Like if you're having uh, suspicious behavior, it can like say, hey, we're detecting a suspicious behavior, or it can monitor all your services in like into one dashboard. But you can also do that in AWS. It's just not as nice. So um, any type of log of any kind gets uh, gets dumped to CloudWatch logs, gets encrypted in there, uh, and then we have those metrics, and then we put that on a custom uh, CloudWatch dashboard. We're doing lots of monitoring. Yeah. So you're getting like both sides. Like you're getting system health stuff, but also like someone viewed this route and this database query took over X amount of time, so you get like a warning or something. We yeah, and we can do that in AWS. It's just we don't have the nice UI, so I feel like we'd have to roll our own. But we have it in place in case you know tomorrow we don't want to use Datadog, but yeah. we love Datadog. It's amazing. Yeah, I like that. So in times of need, when you have errors or something, you know things are going slow, having a UI to actually get that information very quickly is really really nice because the last thing you want is like going through you know like journal CTL logs like that are eight million lines long. We used to use Rollbar. Um, so, but Rollbar, uh, it's more paid now. And so when Rollbar first came out, it was like the hottest thing it was the nicest UI. It was like for developers, but they haven't touched it in years. And so we were going to switch over to Honey Badger or something else. And uh, Datadog does take care of this. We don't even look at errors in Datadog. We just use it for like performance. 
Um, so we just have a, uh, we use CloudWatch uh, and we have a, uh, a rule you can set or a filter, I can't remember what it's called. And anytime it detects an error, you just make a rule like anytime it hits, hits 500, it just emails us. Um, and then what happens is, is that when it hits an error, we've also automated it with systems manager uh, automation to then open a ticket in our GitHub issues. So it basically performs the same, same thing as, as Rollbar, whereas Rollbar will give you, not only give you like, like a list of tasks, it'll collect how many times it occurs and then itemize it for you. Uh, and so we've kind of replicated that in our own sense, um, which is really nice. Yeah. That sounds like a good way to be able to sleep comfortably at night. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, do you want to talk a little bit then? That's, I guess, besides, I guess we can go over like email, like you're using SES for that, right? Oh, yeah, SES and Pinpoint. So, um, uh, so SES stands for Simple Email Service. Uh, it's the equivalent of like Mandrill, which I don't know if that exists anymore, uh, or SendGrid or um, whatever the other ones are called. Yeah. Um, and so it just sends out emails, right? Uh, and it can in accept incoming emails. It's actually, uh, I think it's probably. Well, it used to be the most expensive and the slowest. So uh, before I was like AWS obsessed, uh, we used to use SendGrid. Well, we used to use Mandrill, but the Mandrill wasn't free anymore or something, or they changed something, so we went to SendGrid. But SendGrid, sometimes when you sign up, they have to verify you, and then like you just get stuck, and then you takes forever to get verified. And I said, forget about that. So I just moved over to SES, and I've been loving it since. Um, but all of our campaign emails go through Pinpoint. So Pinpoint's like MailChimp. Um, and you can run campaigns and do A to B testing, uh, and it's wonderful. These services, like when you use them in isolate, they just like they feel really um, rough around the edges. But it's really being able to leverage the entire AWS ecosystem, right? So like, AWS has another uh, thing called Code Commit, which is like GitHub, and it's terrible compared to GitHub. But when you're buying into the entire ecosystem, it's worth it overall, right? So yeah. that's the thing is you have to give up some conveniences for like this uh, grand vision of stuff. So I've actually never heard of Pinpoint before. Is that an AWS offering for like a MailChimp alternative? Yep, that's what it does. But um, I believe it does more than just emails. Um, and it, it, But it's very rich in terms of analytics and being able to track your information. We just use it for emails. So if you see a marketing email from me, it's coming from Pinpoint. Okay. Um, yep. And for uh, listeners, you know, MailChimp or Pinpoint, basically it's just a way to template out emails and like send them to a list and you can kind of measure who clicked what, like open rates and stuff like that. Yeah, that's right. Um, I don't really have an issue with uh, external or third party services. I, I used to use them uh, quite a bit. Uh, my issue is that if you can't uh, put them part of uh, a CloudFormation template or, well, you wouldn't be able to do a CloudFormation, that's only AWS, but like Terraform or serverless um, because I think being able to turn your code into, uh, or your infrastructure into code is very important, right? So imagine you need to sit up an entire uh, web application. You want to have MailChimp and Let's Encrypt and help me out here. I can't think of that many. Uh, <laughs> pusher, pusher and whatever. Yeah. But if you can't automate that, if you have to like sign up for each one and then configure it, that's kind of a pain, right? Big time. Um, and that's actually an issue we ran into with DevTO. I love DevTO, but I'm going to say some nasty things about them. Uh, and it's like, so DevTO, for those who don't know, and this is probably going to end up on DevTO, it is a open source community for developers, and I strongly recommend you to, um, to join. But uh, we wanted to deploy our own version of it because it's open source, uh, because that's the motivation behind that platform, and we couldn't do it. Uh, not that we couldn't do it, it's just like we just said, forget this, this is too, too painful. Uh, and one of the pains that we were experiencing was that they're using all these third-party services that can't be put into a Terraform template. So let's say we wanted to like make it infrastructure as code and automate the whole process, which you definitely want to do because like let's say tomorrow your server dies and you need to spin up entire everything, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you couldn't do it. So I think they just didn't have that visibility because they don't they don't think about that kind of stuff. Um, and so that was a pain point for us. So I just say, if, if you have external services, think about the grander picture. You know, can you write as infrastructure code? Can you automate this stuff? Uh, you know, just because a service has a good offering, does it have a good offering in the grand scheme of things? So that is very good point. So when also when it comes to that though, like on your platform, are you accepting payments from users or no? Yeah. So then, I mean, like Stripe. what payment? Stripe. Pa Stripe. Okay. The AWS has something for payments, uh, but it's kind of weird. Um, but yeah, that's the one exception is Stripe. 
because Stripe just works. Actually, I shouldn't say it just works a lot. Like, I think half our payments don't go through, not because of us, but because, um, and if you're, if you've ever worked with payment gateways, you, you understand this experience, but like, if your bank doesn't like something about this, this place, like, let's say, and I don't know what the issue is because we're in Canada and we bill it in us dollars, but like, I think some, some banks go, Oh, there's a Canadian company and it's billing us dollars. That's weird. Deny, deny, deny transaction, give generic error back to user. And it's so frustrating. Yeah, it really it's is. It's so frustrating, right? Yeah, payments are definitely tricky. And it's like something you really can't control. Like it's nothing you can really do in-house. I mean, if you want to go crazy and become PCI compliant, maybe, but that's not really what most people want to do. I remember a time before Stripe. So if if having some failed payments, even if it's not my fault, and the user did everything right is part of the thing, I'll take it. Yeah. Because trying to implement stuff before was monstrous. Where it's like, they say, do you have an API? And they go, yeah. And they give you like a white paper. And you're like, that's not any, I, how do I implement this? <laughs> right. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, that that's like Salesforce. Have you ever used Salesforce? Uh, they don't have an API. They have white papers and, or something like that. And if you don't understand, it's, it's, it's not because they made a mistake. It's because you didn't pay for the Salesforce training. Hmm. So, but like, that's a sales, that's like a sales world, right? So that's just how they do stuff. It's not like developer friendly. Yeah, definitely not. Mm -hmm. So switching gears now a little bit, you know, that's the AWS setup. Um, and you hinted at this before, configuration management, because I'm a big fan of that as well. Like I mm -hmm. happen to use Ansible, but so you're using um, AWS's offerings for that cloud formation? For, so for Rails for years, I used uh, Capistrano and I love Capistrano. I love it. But, uh, you know, it just was not necessary anymore because AWS had Systems Manager. I've used Ansible. Um, I've used Puppet. I guess you can put Puppet and Chef kind of in the same place because there's configuration management and there's provisioning. Yeah. So I don't know where we draw that line. And there's Salt. I haven't used Salt. But, um, yeah, just Systems Manager. It's very simple. You just um, you provide it commands you want it to run, and it has a nice big GUI, and you can... Uh, it'll, if you want, it'll give you the command line. So you don't even have to like try to figure out what command you have to run. It's dumb and simple. Uh, it's not as rich as Ansible. But the thing is, is that when you architect the way for cloud, you don't need all those advanced uh, uh, features and stuff. So simpler solutions do work pretty well. But um, I, I, I mean, like systems, systems manager is the thing that does all that configuration management. So run command is one of the services which just runs a command on a, 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 a instance, okay? Then you have automation, which allows you to run multiple run commands and also escalate privileges temporarily for that thing that's running. Then they have patch manager, which will continuously patch your servers, which is really nice. Uh, and they have like remediation. So you can have it so you can automate, uh, like let's say something's not compliant for some security reason, you can automate it so that it takes action to like, if a server doesn't meet your demands, it's not secure, it'll like shut down the server or something like that. So there's a lot of fun things like that. So, so. I've, actually, I've never heard of that service. Is that like like a GUI version of CloudFormation or is it something else entirely? No. So CloudFormation is is just infrastructure as code and Systems Manager is like maintenance, configuration, uh, where you'd normally touch the server, it automates that out for you, right? Okay. Um, another thing it has, it, it, can, it has a secret, well, I don't know if Secret Manager is part of that family of services, but um, it has parameter store, and what that will do is it will it will store your parameters, so like all your secrets that you need to like configure your application there securely. And you pull that with an API, uh, and so you could like encrypt it with KMS, so that's very uh, secure. Uh, it also has like State Manager. I've never used it, so it can actually instead of like you running code to to get an outcome, your code on your OS is supposed to be in a particular state. So if Puma is always supposed to be running. That could be a state that you define. And if it goes out of state, it takes action to put it back into state. Okay. But it's, it's, it does a lot of stuff and it's a super rich, um, uh, service and it's always underlooked. But if you started using it, you'd be like, Oh, I don't need Ansible anymore. Not to beat up on Ansible, but, but also, you know, you'd have to buy into the AWS ecosystem. So if you're cross cloud, I don't know how well that works. Right. So sorry, people who are using DigitalOcean. <laughs> So you mentioned operating systems in there. I don't think we talked about this yet, but uh, which uh, distro are you running? Amazon Linux 2. Amazon Linux 2. Makes sense. Yeah. We were trying to Dockerize and we were trying to use Alpine um, just because it's small. Uh, we thought that would speed up our build times or something like that. Anyway, we went back to Amazon Linux 2, uh, which is, it's actually just like Red Hat or CentOS and it's good. 
It's just that when you buy into the uh, the Amazon like Amazon's version, you get so many synergies on the platform. Right. So like, and also support. You know, if you pay for support, everyone's trained on Amazon Linux too. So it just makes sense to do. Yeah. No judgment if you want to use FreeBSD. I used to use that. I love FreeBSD. It just lost to Linux. You know. So. Mm -hmm. So on the topic of your servers, then. Uh, are you allowed to mention like the hardware specs of them? Like what type of instance type are you using? Um, I can. I just don't remember what I wrote down. For our server, we like in each region we run uh, three instances across three AZs. Uh, I believe they're T T two large. Okay. Um. So whatever that is. So I don't. I don't really like. I don't really think about what like what like memory and stuff like that is. But the thing is that because we have multiple ser uh, servers and it's distributed, I don't know what the like. I don't know. It's okay. I can always drop the numbers in later in the show notes, but it's, you know, you have multiple web apps running and they're load balanced. Mm -hmm. That's like the takeaway. Yeah. So you don't need one big, uh, big buddy there to take your, uh, to make sure your site's running. You just have a bunch of little buddies that take care of it for you. Right. So does that also mm -hmm. mean then when you deploy a new version of your code, then there's basically no downtime, I guess, or no? Well, even if we had one server, there'd be no downtime because we use blue green deployment. So people mm -hmm. who don't know what blue green deployment is, that is literally when you spin up an entire new server, uh, and then when it's ready, then you shift the traffic over to it, and then you can kill the old server when you want. Uh, I think uh, people were, were running multi-servers before. They would just like have their server, and we, they would do in-place deployment. If you are from the Rails world, and you're used to using, remember Unicorn, Puma does this as well. They called it zero downtime deployment. Uh, and so what that would do is it would just uh, update your code in place. So check out the repo on the server, um, and it would put it in another uh, directory, and then it would do uh, it would spin up new processes, and you'd have like old and new processes running at the same time, and then it would just kill the old ones when no one used them anymore. And you could still do that on AWS, and you'd have super fast deploys because you wouldn't have to spin up a new server. But you get so many benefits when you spin up brand new servers, right? Like just think of like if you had runaway memory, and every time you did a deploy, you didn't have to worry about the problem. Some other some problems just go away. Right. But the the trade off is like deploys take at least ten minutes but it doesn't matter to us. I think that's a good trade-off because it's not like you have 10 minutes of downtime. The old one is just running in the meantime. But you could you could have, um, well, it depends on how fast you're gonna have to get a change out, right? But you could do both if you wanted to. You could do in-place and blue-green, but forget that. Yeah, that would be quite a bit more complicated maybe. For those who don't know, like if you are new to the AWS platform and you find all these services scary and there's too many of them, AWS has a service called Elastic Beanstalk. It's like the Heroku of AWS but not as nice as Heroku, but definitely uh, easier than using all the services and configuring them yourself. So, you know, now with that, we're talking a little bit about deploying. I think now's a good time to maybe, do you want to walk us through like what a typical deploy looks like? Like how do you get the code onto your server and all that stuff? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I would be working in our Cloud9 IDE and I would uh, make a new branch. I would push that to GitHub. I'd make a pull request and that pull request would then trigger code climate. It wouldn't trigger code climate just yet. It would go to, uh, it would trigger a GitHub hook or whatever they call them. Maybe they're actions now, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would actually go use code build to check out that pull request branch and it would run our test on there. We could have used Travis, but we decided to roll our own just because we're all AWS obsessed. Um, definitely would have been way easier with Travis or a managed service. Um, and then that reports that back to code climate, the code coverage. And if it passes, then it can be merged. Uh, and then if we merge it into master, uh, that's going to trigger a deploy with code pipeline. And so code pipeline uh, will then, uh, using its source, it'll pull it from GitHub, put it in S3, the code, and then it will run code build. And then S3 will pull that from code build. And then it will run tests again, because after you do a merge, you got to run tests again, right? And then if that is successful, then it's going to go on to code deploy. And the code deploy says, hey, we're going to um, do blue green. So we're going to take your auto scaling group, clone it. Auto scaling group uh, is going to automatically by uh, by default start up an instance because it has a minimum requirement, like it has to run exactly uh, whatever it is, three servers. So it's going to spin those up, um, and then uh, code. There's some scripts that's part of code deploy that it's going to then um, pull the, or put the new code, and it's just going to run some scripts to stop and start the server um, and pull the new credentials and stuff like that. And then uh, yeah, there it goes. So a piece of cake, basically. Yeah, just a hundred, <laughs> just a hundred steps. Yeah. So isn't that like a really good testament, though, to having things as automated as possible? Because you wouldn't want to be as a human being running those commands. 
No, you wouldn't. And I mean, this is like what Capistrano used to do. Like their ca commands are being run by your by your local machine, right? As opposed to some server doing it, right? Where you have um, where you have like uh, logging and all the stuff around it. Whereas like Capistrano it doesn't necessarily report every single step of the way. And also like let's say your computer, like let's say your internet went out or something like that, and you're on an old computer that's not a laptop, right? Um, you know that can mess up that deploy or something. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, uh, you just get a lot of stuff around it. But it's really hard to say, like, whether you should use these managed services because they're popping up now. So there's a lot more mini Herokusk. Uh, and my buddies like them. There's like one for Laravel and for that are specialized. And they're just, they're just a veneer or layer on top of AWS where they've automated it using CloudFormation templates to set everything up for you. But, you know, I did that for years. And I think it's just dangerous that uh, you need to really just get that knowledge because at the end of the day, if you're going to scale, you're going to need to have that knowledge anyway. Uh, and you should go take my course. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, for those who don't know, I created a certification material. So, but yeah, so it's just, uh, you know, I just feel that there's a bar and, and anything under the bar is not good enough. And you have to step it up and you have to start using cloud services because it's going to be part of the job. Uh, but if you're running pet projects or startups, you can run to a certain degree with a certain provider for quite a long time. Everyone I know that uses Heroku always loses Heroku because it gets too darn expensive, too darn fast. And then it's painful to move off because it's not well aligned for them to move to cloud services. So then they have this big delay of moving to AWS or GCP or Azure or whatever it is. Heroku, I love Heroku. I launch things on Heroku still uh, for pet projects and stuff like that. But again, it's just like um, if you're doing something for real, uh, you might be p uh, paying for a lot of pain down the road if you're not aware of that. So Definitely. And this really comes back to something you said way back at the start of this. Like It comes down to like your data, right? It's like if you're on Heroku and you want to move, like I don't know, a year after you launch because it got too expensive, it's like you know migrating all of your data out of there could be uh, you know a pretty tricky thing to do depending on what type of app that you have. When you're running on Heroku, it doesn't run on RDS. They actually they set up uh, RDS servers for you, eh? Oh, do they? Yeah. Which, to me, that's a bit dirty um, just because, I mean, I'm sure they do a good job of it. Um, but it's just like, to me, it's just like, oh, it's not RDS. So just for those who don't know, because I was saying earlier, like, you don't want to run something that's not managed. Uh, unless you need, like, something that just there is no offering or there's a feature. But then again, I always tell people, like, be vanilla, you know, try right. not to use exotic features because it'll bite you in the butt later. But uh, yeah. So one question I had before we move on to the next section here about your deployment process, uh, do you run like a, like a database migrations on every deploy or do you hand that, handle that separately? No, the Rails app just does it. So, but every time, every time it deploys, it takes a snapshot before, the, uh, before it does it. So if there is a problem, we just load the previous snapshot. So speaking of problems, then it's like, you know, how have you planned for disasters like that? Do you do database backups? Like what's the frequency and we'll go from there. Uh, so like it's, um, so Aurora already backs up everything automatically for you. So I don't have to think about it for our servers. It doesn't really matter because everything's baked into AMI. So, and then all our data is on S3, like for other stuff. And that's already across whatever it is. I think, I think they say across, is it six AZs? It's something ridiculous. No, it must be three AZs. Six sounds too high, but that'd be cool if it was six. Which is interesting because Canada doesn't have a third availability zone. So like, I don't know how AWS can get, like say that it's across three AZs when Canada only has two. So they're getting a third one soon. But um, no, AWS takes care of a lot of that stuff for you. So we don't have to really worry about any of that kind of stuff. And also we can do, if we want, we can do, um, I can't remember what it is, like five or 10 minute intervals. We don't have to do it very often. But like uh, AWS allows you, it's called sna uh, snapshot or point in time uh, recovery with Aurora and that's with RDS as well. So like, if you have to go like 15 minutes back, you can, right? Mm -hmm. So so you don't have to worry about that, but we do take manual snapshots when we're doing like certain things or even with deploys, just because it's before we even had, we were using Aurora, we already were doing it uh, just because I wanted those snapshots every time there was a deploy, so. That makes sense. You can never be too safe when it comes to payment stuff. So do you do, you do anything at the app level to like protect against uh, maybe malicious users like do you do any throttling or rate limiting for certain routes? Uh, we don't have to because CloudFront takes care of it for us. Um, I think you can do rate limiting with NLB. I, I might be wrong. Uh, with API Gateway, it already has a default um, throttling on it. I think it was like 10,000 per something. 
So there's some same defaults already there with AWS. So I don't really have to worry about it. And also uh, Datadog would detect some kind of weird behavior and also CloudFront would as well because we do have, uh, we're using Lambda Edge and we have a, a couple custom rules because people try to scrape our content. So we need to detect weird behavior like that already. You know, I, I don't like doing it the application because again, you have an application and you have like three or six instances running, right? You know, you don't want to be doing it at those levels. You want to be doing it um, at choke points, right? Yeah, for sure. So so we do it more near the edge, edge being where the traffic's coming in. So I, I think we covered pretty much everything. So what do you, what would you say, like, what's your best tips and lessons learned considering all the things that you've built on AWS and your platform? Um, I would say to you, you need to build way more web applications because what I'm finding is that most people in their career, they'll be like 10 years in, they'll be like, they've built three or four. For me, I built like 40, 50. And it's just like playing SimCity or StarCraft or any video game, if that relates to anybody. Where it's like you're working on your macro and you're trying to figure out how to do those macro builds going forward uh, and help making sure you don't end up in dead ends, uh, which is a big problem. So, you know, you see companies where they just get stuck because, you know, they didn't, they're just doing what's in front of them, right? Whatever's in front of them, that's what they implement. Uh, and so I would say, think about your data. Uh, like, think of that example where I was thinking about like how all the, like, think about things that you might not be using yet, but, you know, like, are you going to be doing, are you going to be running your IDs in the future for automation? Um, are you going to be doing with multi-account? Stuff like that. And try to think more broad. Think like a solution architect. Stop thinking like a developer. That was a bit messy. But yeah, that's my advice. No, that's really good advice. Basically, it comes down to just build, build, build. Because that's the way to learn. So, Andrew, thanks a lot for coming on the Running in Production podcast. It was a pleasure talking with you. Killer. Uh, before can we, we say killer? Up, Sorry, can we say killer? Oh, we can say killer. Okay. I've been told like that's like that's like someone like make like a kill sign to me like saying no, don't say that. <laughs> right. So, so before I wrap this up, uh, do you want to share any links to like your personal site or your AWS platform, GitHub profiles, Twitter accounts, stuff like that? Yeah, sure. I would say the best place to connect with me is LinkedIn. I am LinkedIn obsessed. Uh, so you know if you're there, I'm Andrew hyphen WC hyphen Brown. My my middle names are William and Charles, but uh, for the uh, the uh, people in Europe. Uh, it stands for water closet, which is not that great. If you've ever been in Europe, all the bathrooms say WC on them. <laughs> um, so that's the best place to find me. I'm definitely on DevTO. Definitely got a lot of content on there. Um, so look for ExamPro there. There's the ExamPro website, www.exampro.co. Okay, we couldn't get the .com. All right, so maybe one day. But, uh, you know, and those are those are the main places I am. And we have a YouTube as well, so the ExamPro channel. Uh, and I'm on Twitter and I am on Instagram, but I'm not doing much on there. But if you want to be friends there, I will consider it. Cool. So yeah, I will drop links to all those in the show notes. And uh, thanks again, Andrew. And on that note to everyone listening, thanks for tuning in and I'll see you in the next one. You've been listening to the Running In Production podcast. You can find a full archive of the show at runninginproduction.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe using your favorite podcast player, or leave a review if you like the show.